Hello, my name is John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking again to Brendan Donnelly, the uh, chief executive of the Federal Trust. Brendan, the Partygate scandal is back. Do you think that the prospect of the Prime Minister getting a, a fine uh, from the police um, as part of their inquiry will be fatal for him? I think it will be very serious for him. I think he'd been hoping, hoping up till now that the police would postpone indefinitely their inquiries and that perhaps he might um, manage to get a, a bonus uh, a ironic and tragic bonus from what's going on in Ukraine. Um, but I suspect that he himself realizes that Ukraine is not going to continue to divert attention. That I think was the reason why he made this crass comparison between Brexit and the Ukraine. Uh, there's no reason historically, by the way, why governments shouldn't or our prime ministers shouldn't be replaced at time of war. That's what happened to Neville Chamberlain. It's what happened indeed to, to Mrs. Thatcher. So I think that uh, he is in trouble. Um, and the less favorable the finding of the Metropolitan Police is, the greater the trouble he's in. But the crucial audience for this is, of course, Conservative MPs. Will they really feel that this is going to be enough, taking the view forward towards a, a general election, probably in 2024, that Partygate will be sufficient reason to remove him? Or will it require more, for example, the forthcoming local elections in May? Yes, I, I think the combination of a, of a very stiff fine, a very unfavorable finding from the Metropolitan Police and bad elections in May uh, would, be, would be most dangerous combination for Johnson. It might be that he'd survive even that, um, partly because, uh, as you say, the next general election isn't for a couple of years, and perhaps more importantly, because we have a culture in this country of um, indifference, of shoulder shrugging to, um, to lies, to deception, to half-truths, and, and that's something that comes very much from, from Brexit, um, and it might ironically be that um, Johnson will benefit from that um, over the next six months. It does seem that with his reference to Brexit uh, and linking it to the Ukraine, there is still at the heart of this government a strategy of uniting um, Brexit opinion in a rather divisive way in order to um, remain in power. That The formula that worked so well in 2019 is one that is still viable because of the profound divisions inside Britain, or perhaps particularly inside England. Um, do you think that's the case? And, and does this mean that talk of a progressive alliance and the prospects of, of uh, some uh, significant amount of tactical voting in the next general election uh, to the benefit of the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats um, may not be able to unseat this government? That the formula that he has develop this new English nationalist formula, essentially, is one that is likely to continue to be successful. I certainly think it's one that he hopes and perhaps even believes will continue to be successful. I think in that respect, he's something of a, a one trick pony. Um, people used to say that uh, as far as the Brexit negotiations were concerned, um, the error of Johnson and uh, others um, was to conduct the negotiations as if they were still campaigning in the referendum. Uh, I think that's a, a, a superficial complaint. Um, Johnson is all about a certain kind of divisive campaigning, which he'll certainly continue um, to, to pursue uh, over the coming years. Um, the war against woke, Brexit, um, a, a, an appearance, a, a claim of levelling up, um, personal attacks on um, Starmer, well, all those will be par for the course over the next few years. Um, whether they'll be successful or not is, is another issue. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a progressive alliance. I think that our, our politics are too tribal for that. Um, we have one successful tribe on, on, the, on the right, which is the Conservatives, and we have divided smaller tri tribes uh, on the left. Uh, it's one of the things that anybody who has been involved in electoral politics knows very well, which is that the Labour Party in particular can just about understand the Conservative Party because they're all moral, moral degenerates, but they can't understand or abide the Liberal Democrats because they ought to be on our side. 
So I think that um, that sounds um, uh, a flippant remark, but in, in fact, it's entirely true. It's also true, of course, that the Greens uh, are very hostile to other elements of this progressive, supposed progressive alliance. And we don't know where the SNP would stand in regard to this progressive alliance, particularly electorally. Um, it might be that uh, if um, there were uh, a hung parliament, that the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party could work together, um, that would um, be in some ways a, a more natural fit, although it didn't happen in, in, in 2010. Um, Scotland is a, a, a wild card to watch out for. I think it's possible, entirely possible, um, that neither Labour nor the Conservative Party will be able to form a government in 2024 without Scottish national support. Um, and then that would be a, a ticklish dilemma for both of them. Uh, it might even be that the Conservatives, for all their talk of the unionism, um, will, will be e find it easier to have a, a referendum in Scotland as a price of, of support in a, in a, a, a government. Um, there is, as, as you know, a very substantial body of opinion within the Conservative Party that thinks that um, England will be better off without Scotland. I think there may be a bit more tactical voting, a bit more sophisticated tactical voting um, to come in the 2024 election. I think there is a lot of hostility to the Conservatives and, and Johnson in particular. Um, and I think that people will be uh, considering their vote against that background much more than they have ever before. Whether it will be sufficient to do anything more than win 10 or 12 or 14 seats, um, I rather doubt. It, it doesn't seem to me that the mathematics are, are particularly favourable. Um, nevertheless, those 10 or 12 seats uh, could be the difference between a, a majority for one party, uh, particularly for the Conservative Party, uh, and a hung parliament. Um, and in a hung parliament, then, then all sorts of things come into play. Um, I, I don't, for instance, regard it as a foregone conclusion that if the Labour Party did participate in a coalition in 2024, it would come out of it in 2028 or 2029 um, with the same European policy as it went into it. It seems to me that the, um, the force of events um, might well change what's essentially a holding position on Brexit from, from the Labour Party and Starmer at the moment. So you, you think that a coalition between the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats would actually materially make a difference to Britain's position vis-a-vis um, -vis the European Union? Uh, I think there's a real possibility. It's closer to, to returning to the EU. Oh, yes. Oh, so certainly, I think that the, that the Conservatives would, would simply be in the business of burning further bridges, perhaps um, renouncing the, the Northern Ireland um, uh, Protocol, uh, I, I can't see that a, as being uh, other than um, a, a divisive and an alienating factor vis-a-vis uh, -vis our European partners. Now, I don't think that the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party are going nearly far enough at the moment in, in their rather wishy-washy approach to the European Union, um, but their uh, openness to the European Union and perhaps their willingness to rationalise facts in 2026 or 2027 is much greater than that of the Conservative Party. But why is this not reflected in their current policy position? As I've said, I, I think that these are essentially holding positions because there is a, a lot of turbulence going on in British politics at the moment. Um, and both the Labour Party and, and the Liberal Democrats are finding their way or trying to find that way, uh, their way in this turbulence. Uh, they've already changed their, their policies on Europe several times over the past few years. Uh, I think it's entirely possible that in government they would, they would develop further um, in, in, a, in a more pro-EU, not in a necessarily not just in a pro-European, but a pro-EU way. What about the economy? Because at the heart of what led to Brexit and the heart of the message that Johnson is now trying to maintain across the country of a polarization, uh, divisiveness between those who supported Brexit and those who didn't, was the feeling of very significant economic inequality and the fact that uh, London and the southeast of England had done well out of Europe, had done well out of globalization, the rest of the country hadn't. And the, the Brexit vote was really the mobilization of those who felt they were losers from the economic position. And that is why levelling up is so central to um, the current government's agenda. But the problem they've got is, of course, that the economy is deteriorating very seriously. 
And so their capacity to deliver anything on that is going to be um, very slight. Uh, will they be able to maneuver that through that economic challenge? Will they be able to blame others for the, for the situation or, or will this be the factor well, it, that really brings them down? It's not an economic challenge. The, the economic facts are pretty clear. It's more a political challenge, which you, you uh, hinted at in, in the last um, uh, part of your question. Uh, I think they are condemned um, to pursue this policy um, and hope it works. And I think they're helped in the fact that um, um, Boris Johnson is somebody who, who does believe in creating his own reality by the um, rhetoric that he, he employs. Um, I can't see any reality in the idea of leveling up um, for the north of England. Um, I can see a certain amount of reality in leveling down for traditional conservative supporters in, in London and the southeast. But I, I think Johnson is condemned to pursue this tactic. Uh, it's, what the, it's what they call in bridge playing for the drop, playing for the distribution of cards. Um, he just has to hope that he'll be able to pull it off in more difficult circumstances in 2024. But um, clearly, he might be helped in the fact that we've had COVID. We now have the, the war in Ukraine and the very significant boost in energy prices, which is, is going to make the economic circumstances um, even more difficult. He'll be able to blame these factors um, and divert attention from, from the failures of Brexit. And in fact, he, he may also be encouraged to continue to blame the European Union for some of these problems. Um, do you think that such, a, such an approach could succeed? I think it could succeed, but, but I think that um, the situation in 2024, the electoral situation will be much less favorable for Johnson than it was in, in 2019. Um, uh, we all know that there's a substantial majority of people who think that Brexit has been mishandled or that um, Brexit was a bad idea. That's not the same as saying they want to rejoin as yet. Um, but certainly um, Brexit uh, comes with a, a much greater economic toxicity in public debate now um, than it used to have. I also think that um, Starmer, who, who has his critics, rightly, um, is a much more plausible opponent than, than, than Corbyn ever was. Um, and I'm, I'm not convinced um, that the anti-woke um, uh, campaign uh, means much to most people. It does to a certain tranche of conservative voters who he wants to mobilize, um, but I don't think that they're going to be able to make much headway with that. So I, I think it's a, a, a very open question who's going to win the next general election. Do you think that there are any plausible alternatives to Johnson, given the fact that the Conservatives seem to be locked into this strategy of continuing the polarizing politics of, of Brexit? Um, is there a, an alternative to Johnson who could be as credible for such a strategy? Well, I mentioned that um, Johnson is benefiting from a, a rather cynical um, political culture, which he has himself created. I think he's also benefiting from the fact that there are no plausible ca candidates to replace him. And that's very largely because of his own um, choice um, to surround himself very largely um, with, with the second rank uh, of conservative politicians. There are one or two politicians, uh, potentially the first rank, such as Gove, um, Sunak, um, but they're not people who will commend themselves to the Conservative Party as a whole for, for different reasons. So he is lucky in his internal opponents in that respect. Finally, if the Conservatives do win the next election, either with Johnson or with another leader, essentially on this strategy that you've described of, um, of Brexit polarisation, um, what will that mean for the United Kingdom? I think it will be a very bleak outlook for the United Kingdom, both because uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the internal politics of such a, a, an elect elected government could be stable. Um, but even more importantly, I think the, the coherence, the constitutional coherence of the United Kingdom would be put at risk. Uh, both Sinn Féin uh, and the Scottish National Party know that they have no better recruiting sergeant um, for um, uh, their cause, their cause is, um, than Boris Johnson in, 2000, in, in number 10. Um, it would also be, um, 
on a more general um, scale, um, a, a reward for a, a pretty um, shoddy um, and disgraceful government, which has been in power since 2019. Um, so I think that uh, it would be very bad for our political culture indeed uh, if the Conservatives, and particularly under Boris Johnson, won again in, in 2024. Um, and I'm not sure that I would expect the United Kingdom um, to survive until 2028 or 2029 if that happened. Well, Brennan, thank you for that um, rather pessimistic, but uh, I'm nevertheless accurate uh, assessment of, of our predicament. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed this, this video. Um, and we will do some more in the future. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union um, from the Federal Trust. Uh, we hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.